Good morning. Welcome to another Sunday. Welcome to our church's online service. Welcome those who belong to the BFEC family. Welcome guests. Welcome seekers. Welcome everyone who wants to approach the Lord and draw near to Him today. Um, do shout, shout out or leave a little message to those whom you know are watching this service with you to encourage them, whether on Facebook or on YouTube, or send them a message and to say, come, let's worship the Lord together. And today we will begin um, by reading from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 16 to 18. Uh, you know, in a season like right now where things seem very uncertain and they keep changing and um, we don't even quite know what's going to happen next. And maybe many of us are wondering, what do I do, Lord? What do I do next? What do I do? Um, this week, I was thinking about how God has already told us what we should do, regardless of whatever happens. God has already instructed us what is good for us to do, in all circumstances and that's found in the passage today so will you read it with me let's read it says rejoice always and it says pray without ceasing and it says give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you so if you're wondering hey God what do I do right now when things are so uncertain what do I do God has already told us. In this season, where we don't know what to do next, we rejoice always. Not that we pretend to be happy, but we relocate our joy. We rediscover where our joy is really found. And we pray without ceasing. Not that we just repeat prayers mindlessly, but we keep talking to God about everything. We keep listening to God about everything. We keep asking we keep communing and we give thanks in all circumstances because there are always things to praise God for because He is our God. And so I invite you to join us as we sing about this today. Jesus carried up the hill 
He has walked this path before us. He is walking with us still, turning tragedy to triumph, turning agony to praise. There is blessing in the battle, so take heart and stand amazed. Rejoice when you cry to Him, He hears your voice. He will wipe away your tears. Rejoice in the midst of suffering, He will help you sing. Rejoice, come and lift your hands and raise your voice. He is worthy of all praise. Rejoice, sing the mercies of your King with trembling. Rejoice. God, our Father, our very, very dear Father, who loves us with an everlasting love, we come here today and we choose to rejoice. We choose once again to locate our joy in you and not in anything else. Please help us to do that again and again and again and again because we need it so much. And we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. We rejoice always and we pray without ceasing.
Take in the Lord's Supper. I just want to point out one very important aspect about communion, and that some of you might have read recently about a Singaporean lady who has been serving as the vicar or a priest in a UK church. And because of the pandemic, she has been serving communion with chopsticks, long chopsticks, they call low hay chopsticks, and this has caused quite a stir globally calling her the chopsticks figure, but she said something, something important in an interview that I felt is meaningful that I'd like to share with everyone this morning. And she said that the practice of the Chinese lohe and communion is very much aligned with each other. It is this idea of koinonia, of fellowship, the coming together of a community, the coming together of hearts. Something, something very significant. So, so church, this morning, as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, let us come together as a community, whether it's with your family members right now in your home, or perhaps you are coming alongside with your friends, like-minded people, or even your small groups, online or offline. Let us continue to encourage one another bear each other's burdens and remembering how our Lord Jesus bore the sins of the world on the cross. And the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23, verse 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks he broke the bread and he said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me and the same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord's Supper communion that you have reminded us that as we partake in the bread and drink of the cup we remember your death on the cross until you come again and it's also a symbol of community, of koinonia of us coming together in communion with you and also with each other we thank you for this Jesus, Amen Let's 
partake in the Lord's Supper together. now come to the segment of our offering. Indeed, in times like this, we continue to be reminded that it is a privilege to give, then to receive. And and really, we want to, um, to just invite you in this act of giving of what the Lord has blessed each and every one of us with. This morning, I invite you to take what the Lord has given to you and giving it back for the expansion of his kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, indeed, we thank you that all that we have, our very lives, our bodies, our material blessings, our family that you have given to us, ultimately belongs to you. And this morning as we come together to partake in this act of giving, we ask that, Lord, you continue to grant wisdom to our church leadership to use these funds that you have blessed us with for the expansion of your kingdom, for the proclamation and the demonstration of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. So as a gentle reminder um, that you could give uh, via internet banking or pay now. The details are right there on the screen with the QR code or also on the BFEC website. Before we go on to, into the message this morning, we'll come through a round of announcements. Now, firstly, welcome again for some of you who are joining us right now. And for the first announcement, we have you on the screen. Congratulations indeed um, to Harold and Sarah on the arrival of your second child, Nathan here, Enjie. On the 15th September, just a few days ago, congratulations to the grandparents, uh, Richard Jelly and Chi Yang and Susan. Congratulations to this family indeed. And all the best, especially for these uh, second-time parents for your sleepless nights ahead. Next, it's the announcement of BFEC CARES. Again, this is another round of training to help equip us with the skills to support each other especially to these challenging times. Now note that this course is not just for leaders, but also for anyone in our church who want to come alongside with another fellow Frank Lai, or even with your friends, so that you could provide care or just a listening ear. The details of this training, as you can see, are up on the screen. Six Mondays from October all the way to November in the evening, 8 to 10 p.m. It will be conducted fully online, or via Zoom at no charge, and we invite everyone to sign up by 4th October at the email, as you can see on the screen. Next. Now, every year, um, our missions board ha has been supporting and will continue to support Care Channel's um, calendar project. Now, these paper calendars are handcrafted by beneficiaries in the Philippines, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, and especially for many of them, these profiles, they, they're single mothers, widows, unemployed men, or young adults. So really purchasing these calendars, it's really a, an important source of income uh, for these um, disadvantaged communities. So we invite everyone to visit this link, scan the QR code, um, and to find out a little bit more about these calendars on just to order and to support this ministry. Next. Well, there will be a KSS Zoom on the 27th of September. That's next Sunday at 10 a.m. So parents, remember to mark it down on your calendar and remember to help facilitate your children to get online next Sunday morning. I will now pass the time over to Elder Jim who will share with us about the reopening of our church premises. Right, good morning, church. 
As announced by our chairman last Sunday, we are reopening our premises at 4 LaSalle Street for physical worship services from Sunday, the 4th of October. Now, we will start with one service in English for 50 people at 9 a.m. Now, eventually, we hope to open more services. Uh, so, for example, the Chinese ministry service will restart physical services at a later date. Uh, but meanwhile, we'll continue online. Now, well, this service that will come live from here will be live streamed each Sunday at 9 a.m. Now, let me unpack what that means. It means that every Sunday from 4th October, what the service here will look like is this. We will need to come uh, wearing our masks and observe all safe distancing measures. Now, because there will be no live singing uh, allowed in a group of 50, unlike uh, in this pre-recording on Saturday, we will still pre-record the singing worship segment uh, on Saturday. And then we will play this back as a video during the service on Sunday. Okay? But the rest of the service elements, the rest of the service elements from the Lord's Supper, uh, the sermon, the offering will all be conducted here live on Sunday. Okay? Now, this also means that from 4th October, those worshipping from home, okay, uh, worshipping from home, will get to join in together online from 9 a.m. Now, uh, so those who have been used to assessing the service online uh, at 8 a.m. or 10 a.m., uh, you now come online at 9 a.m. as well. All right? So as we make the time adjustments, I think it is quite meaningful uh, for the entire church to worship together as one at 9 a.m. All right? So that's the adjustment for us to worship from the 4th of October. Now, uh, second slide. As mentioned, the physical gathering, though limited to 50 attendees for now, is open to all. All right? We thought about it. We say we're going to open it to all. However, if more than 50 people register on any particular week, uh, we seek your understanding that priority will be given to those uh, with difficulty assessing our online services. There are members uh, who have difficulty following our services online. But, you know, church, my advice to you is, since we do not know who is going to register, um, don't start by saying to yourself, um... Let others go first. My suggestion is you just register. Then we will also know uh, the numbers that are coming in. Okay? And then we will make adjustments from that. Okay? So you, you just register as the Lord leads you. Now, registration, what does that mean? It helps us ensure every of the 50 seats is accounted for. Right? Uh, we don't want suddenly 70 people to come on any Sunday and then we have to turn you away because that's the current uh, advisory given by the government. So that's why we need online registration. Now we will provide a hotline, a phone hotline also uh, to help you do this registration. For better accountability, this registration is on a week-to-week -week basis. So there's no advanced booking like two weeks ahead or block booking every Sunday. Uh, we appeal to you for good accountability and really no one knows what the week holds ahead, right? God willing. So Week to week, Mondays to Fridays, we will open up the registration for you. So for the very first service um, for 4th of October, one week before that, the link and the hotline for online registration will be provided and activated. So that's on the 27th of September. Just next Sunday, we will give you the link, we'll give you the hotline, and then you can start booking from there. All right, so don't kan chiang. Stay cool until next Sunday. All right? But church, most importantly, I do appreciate it if you would all join me to pray and uphold the team that is making preparations uh, for this. So let's be in prayer. We really look forward to, to this, and I know you do too. God bless. Thank you, Elder Jim. Now we've come to week three of Missions Month. And just in case you're not aware, um, what, we, what the Missions Board has um, planned for intentionally for this month is to has, has been to invite speakers uh, who represent different parts of the world where our church either has uh, missionaries working or serving in those parts of the world or our church 
has partnered with certain mission agencies and ministering to the least rich in those parts of the world. So this week, we will focus on Bangladesh. Uh, that's one of the largest least rich or unreached people in the world, according to Joshua Project. However, this year, you will not be hearing from me, um, representing OM, but you will instead hear from my co-worker, David Levet or Dave Levet, uh, who has served with OM um, with his wife, Pam, for more than 40 years, living in India, um, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, T Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and many places. He's amazing. And we have, our church has invited him to speak to us this morning. And because I really felt that Dave could give us really that deeper and, and broader picture of what God is doing in Bangladesh and also in the region of West and Central Asia, where Dave right now is one of our regional leaders overseeing these ministries in this part of the world. So our brother Dave's topic for us this morning is Plant Bangladesh. Over to you, Dave. Well, thank you so much for this amazing opportunity and privilege to be speaking with you in your missions event at Bethesda Frankel Estate Church. And I want to thank you for inviting me to be a part of this really special time there. And I'm so excited to be able to tell you and take you on a journey with me into what we call Western Central Asia. This is, broadly speaking, the Turkic world, Persian world, and then South Asia, which is the area of the world that I've been serving with Operation Mobilization for the last 40 years. And I have to say that in the last 40 years of ministry in these countries, it has been one of the greatest times of opportunity, spiritual breakthrough, than anything we've seen in most of us in our whole lifetimes. But I'd like to start by introducing you to my family, uh, my wife here on the left, Pam. We've been married almost 40 years. Uh, next to her is our son, Justin, and his beautiful bride, Cohen, who's a missionary kid who grew up in South Korea, and they're actually living in South Korea now. And then to the right is my daughter, Rachel, her husband, Josh, and our granddaughter. They're living here in the USA. But I have to let you get one peek of our new addition. Uh, little Will here was just born a few months ago to my son and his wife living in Seoul, Korea. And his wife, Cohen, is a missionary kid, her parents are still missionaries down in Kenya. But the part of the world that we've been serving and working in for most of these years is South Asia, countries like Bangladesh, India, Pakistan. And uh, the Lord led us to have a stronger focus on who we call our cousins in that part of the world. And this was uh, Bangladesh. First of all, our daughter was born there. And over all these years, our passion and our focus of our ministry has been training and empowering national believers and faith, faithful believers. Second Timothy 2.2 2 says, find faithful men and women who you can train, who will then train others. And that's been so much of our strategy and our passion in this part of the world. Another area that we've been deeply involved with is the Persian world. In places like Tajikistan, Afghanistan, and Iran, places that you'd think are, are just too difficult, maybe too hard for the gospel. Uh, Pam and I initially went and spent two years in Afghanistan learning the Afghan language, then moved to Tajikistan up here for 15 years after the breakup or the collapse of the Soviet Union. And we had the privilege of serving and sharing the love of Christ with a people group that had been cut off from the church for literally centuries. And we saw the first Tajik churches begin to come into existence as we served them through disaster relief and community development and many other ways, especially as they had experienced the civil war. But then the Lord led us into a place I never expected, which was Iran. Uh, it's a country that many of us will remember back in 1979. They had an Islamic revolution and um, churches were closed. Literally, pastors were killed. Almost all the missionaries were kicked out of the country. We sort of wondered, God, what are you doing? And literally at that point in history, we only knew of about 500 Iranians who were followers of Christ inside the country. So it has been one of the greatest amazing breakthroughs that we've ever seen that fast forward in 40 years now we've seen about 500,000 maybe up to a million Iranians inside the country have come to faith in Jesus and it's there's been breakthroughs like this in so many other countries 
In fact, uh, we've seen in about 69 other countries where our cousins are living, uh, more breakthroughs of people hearing and responding and embracing Christ in the last 15 years than we've seen in the last 1400 years. And many of these places like Bangladesh, like the Stans or Iran, and yet we're facing still a huge challenge. This map of the world reflects, on the one hand, the green areas, uh, the kind of yellowish areas, are where the church exists, where it's thriving, where it's multiplying, it's growing, it's, there's freedom. And yet these red areas represent those parts of the world that still are almost completely unengaged. There is no church, there are no Christians, there are no missionaries, and many times they're the center of extreme persecution of believers. Uh, some of these countries that have the highest number of unreached peoples in the world, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, China, Nepal, and I'm so grateful that you have a heart and concern for Bangladesh where we're going to be spending a little bit more time this morning looking at. But if I could show you a map of the world that was reflecting the realities there in a geographic form, the unreached peoples of the world are just, are just exploding. It's, it's so large in places like South Asia. We need to be giving a higher priority to those places like Bangladesh. And I appreciate uh, your vision and why you're involved in this. And why is this so important? Well, it is described in your statement of why you're even having this missions conference, Revelation 7-9, that before the throne. One day we're going to see people out of every kindred, tribe, tongue, nation worshiping before the Lamb. And that's what our passion and our focus is. And we've been about this task for quite a while. When we started 40 years ago with Operation Mobilization, um, we haven't seen still all the breakthroughs during these years that we'd wanted to see. So we're still very committed to going down this road to see Matthew 24, 14 finished. And it's the scripture where Jesus said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed as a testimony to all nations, which is ethnic groups, people groups, like Iranians or Tajiks or Afghans or Turks or Uzbeks or Bangladeshis. And then the end will come. And, and we're still very involved and we're so thrilled to be sharing this with you today because I know that's the journey you're on as well. And Acts 1.8 says, And you shall be my witnesses after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll um, reach out to Jerusalem, to Judea, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts 1.8 is still our calling. It's still something that we want to embrace and invite you to continue to get more deeply involved in as a lifestyle. Missions is not something for a few special people called to be, quote, super spiritual missionaries going overseas. It's a part of our lifestyle, every one of us. We want to be his witnesses in our Jerusalem, in our own nearby cities, in our own neighborhoods, and also let's embrace and let God expand our hearts for these other peoples who still have never heard the gospel. I don't know if, how you're feeling in the middle of COVID-19. It, it feels like it's very chaotic. It's, it's hard to always know how to respond. <clears throat> Sometimes I feel like the airplane that was flying across the Atlantic Ocean and the pilot got on the loudspeaker and he said, folks, I have some good news. I have some bad news. Bad news is the radar equipment, computer is broken. We don't know where we are. We're lost. But the good news is we're really going fast. And we're, if you're like me, you can feel like this. We're just sort of racing through life. And there's so many things coming at us. It is so important that we're making sure we're staying on course with God's purpose in the world and how he wants to use each one of us. Ephesians 2.10 says this, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, for ordained to walk in them. And today I believe God wants to speak to you. I believe he wants to renew in you a fresh sense of destiny and a greater understanding of his purpose in the world and what his plan is and how he wants to use you in fulfilling that. The passage that I sent to you all in John chapter 4, verse 27 to 35, is this amazing story of Jesus taking the time 
on his way to Galilee to go to Samaria and to meet this woman. We don't know her name. She is the Samaritan woman by the well. And we all, many of us know this story already. And it's a beautiful story. Jesus goes out of his way, reaches out to this woman who's come to act, draw water from the well. Um, it's, it's, it's really important to understand the history that actually the Samaritans were despised by the Jewish community. No self-respecting Jewish person or a rabbi for sure would ever take time to be with them. You shouldn't eat together. You shouldn't talk together. In fact, th sometimes there were just violent clashes between the Jews and the Samaritans. And Jesus reaches out to this Samaritan woman and the story goes on and you get to uh, verse 25 where the woman finally says, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. It's an amazing story when you think that Jesus, just right out front, he's revealing himself. He's saying, yes, I am the Messiah. And What's about to take place is she's going to run back to her village. She's going to tell everybody about that she's just met the Messiah. And actually through her, the whole village is going to come to faith in Christ. But the point of the story I want to bring up is in verse 27. And it says, at this point, his disciples came and he marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? And then they... In the meantime, as, as, as uh, the disciples have come and they're watching, they're basically looking at each other and they're saying something like, what's the master doing talking to her? And why is this woman talking with Jesus? And yet what's happening here is through this story. This woman is going to come to believe in Jesus and she's going to bring her whole village along with her. In the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat something. And he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know anything about. In other words, brothers and sisters, Jesus was doing something. They just didn't have a clue what he was doing. And they're look, looking down at, at their food. And Jesus then looks at them and says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months? And then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. It's an amazing story. Jesus giving this very practical example to the disciples, showing them how to reach out, like Acts 1-8 said, reach out beyond your comfort zone, reach out beyond your little club, reach out to these people that even you don't like and you maybe have some deep prejudice against and you don't like them. And Jesus is giving and demonstrating this and yet the disciples were focused on something else and the challenge for us today is there are about three billion people in the world including the Bangladeshis who still have never heard the good news about salvation through the Lord Jesus about God's love do you know the number one reason most of these people never become believers in Jesus is not because uh, they hate Christians or they have some um, fanatical resistance to the gospel. Most of them have never met a follower of Jesus. They've never seen someone compassionately reach out to them, befriend them, love them, share some of this truth with them. And the disciples are looking down. In other words, I think Jesus was saying, guys, stop looking down at the everything that the world says is so important. And what does the world say we should be pursuing? Financial security, comfort, status, power, prestige. And Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to eat my food, if you're going to take on my lifestyle, then you're going to lay those things all down. That isn't what my food is all about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me to finish his work. And the question I have is we're going at here is what satisfies you? What is it that you wake up with and say, this is my passion. This is my purpose. This is what I want God to do and I believe God wants to do through my life. And if you don't have it, ask him for it. God will give you that renewed sense of purpose and understanding of how Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. 
So how can you be about serving? It may be just in your church, partly in your neighborhood, but it is also including these peoples that we're looking at today. Someone once said, break my heart, Lord, with the things that break your heart. And as we look today, I pray God will do that for us. His help our hearts be a little bit more open to take in some of his heart for some of these places and peoples. One of them is Bangladesh. It's a place where we've been serving as a mission for 50 years. It's the most densely populated country in the world. Dhaka City here has 120,000 people per square mile. It's 90% our friends and our cousins from that part of the world. And yet it's been an amazing place of openness still where there's freedom for the church, freedom to, for people to worship, freedom for people to express and share and live out their faith. And thousands of our cousins have come to faith in the last few years. But it's still a very, very small percentage, probably less than almost half a percent of the people in Bangladesh are following Christ. We have five outreach centers there serving communities in a holistic ministry. So we're doing everything from disaster flood relief to educational programs and literacy. And um, it's mostly through community outreach that we're involved there. For example, we're dealing with issues of injustice like trafficking of children. There's about 9 to 10 million children in Bangladesh who are illegally in child labor by the time they're five years old in a sweatshop or children like this rolling cigarettes for eight hours a day for about a dollar a day. The problem is the parents are illiterate. They don't understand that if you don't send your child to school for grades one, two, and three, they're banned forever. They can never attend a public school. So you, you, you miss that window. And it's a uh, terrible dead end world without hope for children. So we've started about 45 schools there. And our teachers, our followers of Jesus, they're embracing and sharing something of God's love while they're teaching and educating these children. And it's giving them the opportunity to actually go back and, and catch up. So the children are anywhere from 6 to 12 years of age, and it's a joy and a blessing to see their lives transformed, them get a new sense of joy, and have a better future um, where they can look past just a kind of slave labor that they've been living. So it's a great project that we're a ministry we're involved with is in rescuing kids being trafficked. The next challenge for many of these young children, though especially girls, is that like this girl Jasmine, she had gone through our school, she was working for her dad in a shop, and it was so ha I was so happy to meet her and see her, and yet I realized the big danger for her next is she'll be a child bride. 20 million girls in Bangladesh will be married by the time they're 15, and as young as 10. And Beauty was one of these young girls. She was 14, when she was married to an older man she'd never met, and I'd like you to stop for a moment and listen to her story on this video. So the situation here in Bangladesh is that although it's illegal, girls in rural areas are still often married at 11, 12 years of age. And in fact, I, the last I read, I think it's 20 million girls who are married here in Bangladesh at 11 or 12 years of age, which is hard to imagine what it would be like for my daughter to be thinking of that happening. What happens when a girl gets pregnant when she's 11 or 12 years of age is she's not prepared physically to give birth. And so often the baby then dies in childbirth. In the process, her whole birth canal and, and that part of her body is totally, in a sense, ripped up and torn apart. And it becomes infected. And she, the shame is so great that she will often never even leave her house. The first step to help a young girl find recovery out of that life is to get a surgery done and that's in cooperation with Lamb Hospital. It's quite complicated. Often three or four times she has to go in for surgery. 
Then after that, we do an empowerment through education and a vocational training program where we teach her not only how to read and write, we'll teach her a skill and give her a sewing machine that she can support herself and her family and children. আপনার <laughs> কি পরিকল্পনা করব আর সাধারণ পরিবারের মানুষের পরিকল্পনা আছে দিন যাচ্ছে এটাই বেশি বেশি ধান্দা নাই আমার মতো যারা আছে তারা যেন সুস্থ হয় বা এরকম জীবনে আর অনেক কিছু করতে পারে তারা ভালোভাবে চলতে পারে ভালোভাবে থাকতে পারে কারণ এই জীবনটা তো অনেক কষ্টের তারা যেন আর এই কষ্ট না পায় আমার সব সময় তাদের জন্য দেওয়া আমার মতো যেন আরও জীবনে এরকম না হয় যদিও হয় তারা যেন সুস্থ হয় এবং আমার মতো ভালো স্বাভাবিক জীবনে ফিরে আসে Later, when she was able to meet the Christian staff in that hospital, she said, I was so surprised that they treated me with respect. And then when she started into our tailoring program, where we began to teach her to read and write and a, and a skill, she said, I was so surprised that, again, these teachers treated me with respect, and, and I began to have a sense of my dignity being restored. And they, they had a joy and a hope I longed for Finally, they invited her to a Christmas program, and she said, I, I was amazed to think that Jesus or God would actually love me, considering I've been completely shunned by my society and my family. Through a Christmas program later, as some of the women there who were believers in Jesus shared the good news with her, she also decided she wanted to trust in Christ. And she said this, I never dreamed that one day I would truly see myself as beautiful, but now I do. I never thought that one day I could see my tears turn to joy, but now they have. I'm a beautiful new creation in Christ. And uh, beauty story needs to be repeated over and over. There's so many women like her who need to ex experience something of the love of Jesus through our uh, ministries and, our, and the work we're doing. We still are helping beauty through some study and discipleship programs, and um, we're reaching out to other women like her. But it's not the only issue. COVID-19 has come crashing down into Bangladesh, and these last months, millions of people who are day laborers, often are earning two, earning two or three dollars a day, were put on the streets, and you go for two weeks, three weeks without income, eventually you run out of food. We had some People say to us, I'd rather die of COVID-19 than starvation. So we started to provide very simple food packs that would enable someone and a family for a couple weeks to continue on and have been distributing food relief and hygiene packs and giving instruction about, about COVID-19 to thousands of families there. Many of them have come back to us. These are our cousins in those neighborhoods saying, so why are you here? Why would you care about us? Nobody else cares. And it's been a great opportunity where our staff can then just practically begin to explain the good news of what, what motivates us. That Jesus said the two greatest commands, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we begin to explain who God is and what's the other message we have. And we pray with them. In a few cases, uh, we've even been able to give out a copy of the scriptures when someone is really interested. 
But this whole area of Bangladesh also got hit in May by Super Cyclone Amphan. They've also in the last two months had the worst rains and flooding in 20 years. And so our staff are continuing to reach out to these families. And this is very current. This is just uh, on these last days where we're reaching out to help people practically. And we're going to continue to be doing more of this relief work in these coming weeks and months as we need to uh, help them survive. The other place I'd like to take you is southeast Bangladesh along the border of Myanmar. Most of you remember three years ago over a million Rohingya refugees fled Myanmar and the genocide that was taking place there. It is the largest refugee camp in the world. It's hard to describe what it's like to walk through there and have these just for miles and miles people living in small little plastic huts with plastic sheeting over their heads, strips of bamboo holding it together. Um, the conditions are, are, are just abysmal. This is a water source we found for one village of refugees that we were walking with, helping them as best we could. Some of our staff there have been working there for almost two years, reaching out, making friends, Again, doing whatever we can to alleviate and help in that suffering. Sometimes it's been it's just been getting everybody out to play sports. Uh, even in the rain, when it's just pouring rain there, uh, people love to be involved in some community activity. Children, of course, are the most vulnerable in many ways, so we've been trying to work at setting up child-friendly spaces, and we've actually built now five schools, not just for Rohingya kids, but also for local children there. And our staff are, are just reaching out, all I can say, with the compassion and that something of that um, inspiration by the Holy Spirit that comes from Acts 1.8. And Ashish was invited over to one family's house, the Rohingya refugees there, and this family had a newborn baby, and they asked Ashish, please come over. You've become such a close friend. We want you to name our baby. And so he came in to their house, uh, prayed for and named the baby Abraham or Ibrahim and then began to explain something of what that has all meant in his life as a follower of Christ. COVID-19 is there as well, so we're helping hundreds of families with food rations, uh, doing whatever we can in the midst of that suffering. But, and we're also sensitively, as people have a desire, we're doing Bible studies and discipleship with women, with men, and sometimes with children. My wife and I were there visiting last year and visiting in a couple of these families. This doesn't look like much, but this is actually somebody's front of their house. And it's like a five meter by five meter sitting area. We were sitting there with them for a few hours and we asked them, so you're a follower of Jesus. How can you grow spiritually? Do you have any other believers you can meet? Uh, is there any freedom for worship? Can you even read the Bible here? And they said, well, actually, we wait till midnight every night. And when everybody else in our area is asleep, because we have just plastic between our houses, because um, they're afraid for themselves, they um, read the Bible and then just quietly pray. Unfortunately, a few hours after we visited that day, masked men with guns did come and threaten this family, and they had to leave for two days to go to another camp. We visited this, this man who was a, a pastor of a local house church of 20 believers. And he also, unfortunately, a few months ago, uh, about 80 of these believers were attacked by these Islamic extremists who came in with knives, with swords, whatever weapons they had, and rampaged through the camp, attacking local believers there. Uh, about 80 of them had to go to a nearby hospital that's run by Christians called Malamgat Hospital and they're, they're serving them. Unfortunately, a week ago this happened again. I just, we just got news of another attack from ISIS extremists against many of these Rohingya believers, and about 12 of them were taken to a nearby hospital, and we're looking at how we can come alongside and help them. So this is a lot of the focus we have is coming alongside our Bangladeshi brothers and sisters, encouraging them, supporting them, coaching them, training them, and um, we want to say thank you for your partnership, your interest for Bangladesh, and want to invite you to continue to join with our team there in embracing missions as a lifestyle and become a part of reaching out to the whether it's children, these women, or the Rohingya refugees, and um, be a part of, of what the Lord is doing in this amazing country. 
So looking just in the, summarizing, we've been looking at this part of the world, West and Central Asia, again these Turkic based countries, the Persian speaking countries, and then this whole challenge here of South Asia. And we have a huge challenge. We have almost 920 million cousins in that part of the world, in these countries. And the huge challenge is also they're 95% unreached. They've never heard the gospel. There is no church there. There are no followers of Jesus. For every million cousins in that part of the world, there are about three workers, three people who are actually trying to reach out and share the love of Christ with people in practical ways. There's a huge imbalance also in the resources and finances for reaching out into this part of the world. Here in the USA, for every dollar given to Christian causes of all kinds, and for example in the church, how much do you think goes to reaching the unreached in these places we're talking about? About half of a cent. There needs to be a greater priority and focus of our resources, of our prayers, of our hearts and compassion for this part of the world. And we want to say thank you because I know that that's where your hearts are and that you want to be more involved. What is it going to take to finish the task as we've started? And what is it going to take to fulfill the vision of Revelation 7-9 that I know is at your heart and your heart's there? It's going to mean we take on and say, Lord, Acts 1-8, we want to be renewed in our commitment to say our food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish that work. And Acts 1-8 is that work. We want to invite you today to embrace missions as a lifestyle. Reaching out there in your community in Singapore, reaching out all the way over to Bangladesh. And someone has said, um, you know, life is like a coin. You can spend that coin any way you want to. But just remember this. You can only spend it once. And that coin for me is representing our lifestyle. And I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me today. And just to imagine holding out your hands. And imagining that in that ha your hands is that coin. And that coin represents your lifestyle. It represents your resources. It represents who you are. And I want to invite you to say, and to surrender it and say, Lord Jesus, this coin is for you. God, take this coin, take my life, my lifestyle, and spend it any way you want to. To finish the task, your name be glorified, your name be known among all these peoples that we've been focusing on and we know that you said we should lift up our eyes and see that the harvest is white. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave, for sharing that message with us. And, and really, I personally identify a lot with what Dave has shared with us this morning. Just two years plus ago, I was there on the ground visiting some of our work in Bangladesh and also visiting um, the refugee camp, um, the largest refugee camp in the world, Cox's Bazaar, and, and it's just, just heartbreaking. It's miles and miles, as far as my eyes could see, it's just shacks, um, people huddled together um, in this way. And, and really, as you hear what, what Dave has shared about what has been happening in that camp, broader also in Bangladesh, I think really, that compels us. What is our role, Lord? It's not just about this month, this missions month in church. But what is our lifestyle? What is our life on a daily basis that we can do to make a difference? Now, our church and our mission board, we've made some decisions over the we've been deliberating about this. And, and recently we have, because of a decision that's been made, to support this work um, in Bangladesh through OM. But before that, there were some other churches that have also been supporting some of these work. And I remember one particular story when I was there. Uh, in the northern part, there was a flood. And because of some church funds that have gone over um, to help certain communities during their time of need, and they said, 
Nobody came to help us. The government didn't really care about us. Even, in fact, even if the officials came, they would ask us for money. When our homes have been washed away, the officials would ask us for money and all sorts of things. It's messy. But yet you, you guys came in the name of Christ and you helped us. And that's the OM Bangladesh team. Using funds that have been sent by churches in Singapore and really just helping them rebuild their lives. And after that, they asked, why do you do that? And then that's when they talked about what Christ has done in their lives. And through that, a small fellowship was started um, among, and, and really in the house of a local village chief. A local village chief. And that small fellowship just started and it continues to grow. And it's really testimony to God's goodness. And, and really in that broader picture of God's kingdom, that's where the people are. And in some ways, this is how we can, also we can also participate in God's mission through giving, through praying, and some of us through going. And so this morning, as, as we end off this service soon, on our third week of our missions month, I just continue to invite you to pray, to pray for God's workers in the field that even amidst this uncertainty, they will continue to labour, so John, for the local churches in West and Central Asia, in Bangladesh, they will continue to be a witness to the least rich. Pray, brothers and sisters, for them. <clears throat> and pray for yourself on what you can do. And if this is a time of a season that we can't go physically easy, that, that easy, we can give as well. We can give towards the Lord's work and that we can see some fruit in time, in His time, that we will see people turn their hearts towards God. So as we end, let me just pray and end of the benediction. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of Jesus, for Lord, how He has shown us by ministering to those who are the least and the lost and those who are just desperate for the gospel, desperate for so many things in life, not just because they have they are rich or they are poor, but because they know that there's something that they need that fills their heart that Lord you've created us to be. And so, so Lord, even as our Lord has also given us this great commission that each and every one of us has also that mandate to not just lead their missional lifestyle here in Singapore, but also partake in the great commission. Help us, Lord, to continue to pray, to give, and to go, whether physically or even digitally, in the expansion of your great kingdom and the fulfillment of your great commission. And brothers and sisters, let's receive this benediction as well. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you. Have a fruitful week. See you next Sunday.